the youth of Bhutan embody vigor and energy, and they are ready to serve without fear or hesitation when needed. I am always profoundly heartened when I hear their aspirations and see their enthusiasm. His Majesty the King. Charos, Vice Chancellor Needup, CNR President Sonam Wongchuk, Loden and UN colleagues, and our online viewers joining us via Facebook. Kuzuzong Bola. Welcome to the 40th session of Bhutan Dialogues. The theme for today's special edition of Bhutan Dialogues is Bhutan's Young Changemakers, New Ideas for All Problems. Young people of any country are its greatest asset. We look to the young as important development partners because they are our future. You are our partners and tomorrow our leaders. We look to the youth as important development partners because they are our future. You are our partners and tomorrow our leaders. The time is now to encourage our youth to do better in every field. The time is now to listen to the youth. And as a result, we have this special session on International Youth Day of Bhutan Dialogues to listen to youth. On behalf of the UN and Loden, I urge the youth to question adults. What can we as adults do to promote more young role models? How can we encourage you to be inspired to become role models for future generations of Bhutanese. You are part of the biggest generation of young people in history. We look forward to young men and women like you to bring new energy, creativity, and dynamism to labor markets, to schools, to CSOs, to universities like this one, to government ministries, and I hope to international relations and the United Nations. The UN and Loden is working with you and for you to provide opportunities for a better future. And to achieve these, we need to bring together towards achieving more equitable food systems. The youth must bring right decisions on food choices, focusing on sustainable options for both the individuals and the environment. Given that we are holding today's Bhutan Dialogues in CNR, I'm expecting strong ideas and comments with respect to the state of agriculture here in Bhutan. Please be frank, as we are listening with open hearts. Our first panelist is Ugin Sering, the founder of Greener Life Farm in Paro and Your Food Basket, which brings fresh organic produce from farm to plate using technology and innovation and a community-supported agriculture model. Our second panelist is Nisha Gurung, a student of BS Food Science and Technology here at CNR. She has interned at the National Post Harvest Center in Paro. And our final pa panelist is Paldon Wongchuk Dorji, a student of BS Agriculture at CNR. Driven by his passion to learn new things, he believes in lifelong learning and aspires to make a difference in Bhutan's agriculture sector. Our host, Dr. Karma Funso, works, he has a twofold focus. He believes in being a disruptive thinker and a social worker, especially with the Loden Foundation, where he promotes social entrepreneurship amongst the nation's youth, a majority of whom are either unemployed or underemployed. My closing. Three points. First, let me take this opportunity to congratulate CNR and the Royal University of Bhutan for about to being commence the PhD in climate studies. I believe this is a landmark point in time where the Royal Government of Bhutan, the Royal University of Bhutan, is thinking into the future and finding the best answers to the challenges we will be facing. Secondly, in terms of the Q&A, 
please keep your questions short and to the point for those joining us online. Please keep your questions in the chat box and Suring will read them on your behalf in groups of three questions at a time. And finally, let me end with a quote from the UN Secretary General. We cannot afford to be the generation that fiddled while the planet burned. But there is also hope. From climate action to gender equality to social justice and human rights, your generation is on the front lines and in the headlines. The UN stands with young people and belongs to you. Tashi Delay, and thank you very much. Dashu VC, uh, President, Registrar, Faculty, and uh, all the members of the CNR family, Kuzu um, And Kuzu also to the three panelists. It's uh, wonderful to be here on uh, the International Youth Day and to bring Bhutan Dialogues for the first time out of Thimphu. So uh, it's a, a good achievement for us to break the Thimphu-centric approach to doing things. And it's uh, particularly delightful to have three young panelists talk about uh, what matters to us. And I normally, when I go around talking to young people like uh, the students here at CNR, I say we are made up of two things. We have our body and we have our mind. We the same. These two things make a person. What we think normally, generally makes our mind. And what we eat, I suppose, makes our body. Today we are finding an opportunity to address both issues, to sort of kill two birds with one stone, so to say. At Bhutan Dialogues, we normally have this discourse and discussions to broaden our um, limits of thought, to carry out civil conversations, you know, kind of a right speech practice, and to do mindful listening. And through that, we try to refine the development processes, the ideas of human progress as a whole. So it is really good that we can bring food which sustains our body and talk about it and discuss it which will, of course, enhance our mind. Um, with that, um, I have actually been uh, carrying out this as a host for the last uh, uh, three years or so. We have had 40 sessions. This is the third one where we are having a group of young people. Normally, we bring role models and big players in our economy or in our uh, society. But it's very important for us to also think about the future by involving the people who will be owning that future. So thank you for joining us. And my first round of questions for you is pretty straightforward. I want to find out about you through what you eat. So Peldin, what did you eat for lunch? What is your eating habit normally like? Well, like any Buddhist, my staple diet is rice. And then yeah, we, uh, for the lunch today, I had beans with cheese. And yeah, most of the time when I'm back at home, I'd have this diverse, you know, like amount of like curries and all of that. But in college, it's a bit different. And yeah, I had a tough time in the beginning to adjust. But now after three years, yeah, I've, I've adapted well. But is rice normally your staple food? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, so, Nisha, now my take on rice as a staple is a little controversial, you could say. I personally think that Bhutan should go back to its past. Some Western values of Bhutan had rice as a staple food. But you look at central Bhutan, we had buckwheat, sweet buckwheat, barley, wheat. Eastern Bhutan had maize. <coughs> Southern parts of Bhutan had millet. Now we are relying so much on rice, which is imported from India. And economically, it's bad. Health-wise, NCDs stop the main medical cost. Right? So what is your diet like? Do you consume rice as well? And are you okay in your conscience to eat rice? About my eating habits, like any other Bhutanese, I also have the three meals, rice, rice, rice. And my roommates are very much, you know, about unfaithfully true about their, you know, their morning routines and all those things. And they always make sure that they 
uh, take all three times, you know, the meals on time. And it's all the time the rice, rice, rice. Mm. And as you said, la, um, the, my take is similar to yours. La. The uh, rice as a staple diet, it has lots of, it, although it is part of our culture, but it has lots of, you know, uh, adverse things to it. For example, it has high glycemic ish, uh, glycemic index, and then it uh, it can lead to it can lead to diseases such as uh, diabetes. La. So we have to change this ish, uh, change this la. Uh, For example, even if we have two times uh, two two meals rice, we should be having one of them as. Uh, Something else, la. as you mentioned, la. for example, we can have tengma, we can have puta, and all those things in our diet. La. So I recommend you know, yes. infusing those in our diet. La. But Ugen, you're different from the other two. You're living an independent life as an entrepreneur. What's your diet like? And can you explain why you eat what you eat? I, I think it's quite interesting to note that the early phases of the entrepreneurial journey is there are many days where you have to stay hungry. And uh, in that, I think it's basically whatever is available. Uh, mm -hmm. You do not have much of a choice. Uh, and quite interestingly, it's actually quite expensive to eat healthy, uh, especially if you're in Timpo and uh, you're, you're trying to uh, meet a lot of ends meet. So uh, I, it has changed a bit uh, from how I started the journey initially when I came out from my college after completing my diploma. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we just consumed whatever was available, me and a group of friends who uh, we decided to work on some projects together. So we, we basically consumed whatever was available. Uh, the food were actually quite rich uh, when we went on conference. Uh, <laughs> I think there was a lot of uh, entrepreneurship conference that was around. Uh, there was a lot of um, not necessarily healthy food, but good delicious food that was available. And also it was quite interesting to note that uh, 50% of it goes to waste. Uh, now, in, in right now also, I'm still at the stage where I'm trying to uh, make a lot of things add up. So um, basically, I'm also culturally ingrained to uh, eat what I've been consuming for a long time. I think it's really hard to make that transition. Mm. But I have integrated a bit of apple cider vinegar into my diet. I consume it uh, as I wake up and before I go to bed. Apple cider vinegar. For most Bhutanese, this would be a new term, but uh, Ugen is introducing that in the market. Um, do you eat mostly what you produce yourself or what you uh, at least sell other people? Uh, right now, I think where our startup is at, at a phase where we still buy most of mm. what we eat from outside. Mm. Uh, we're just growing a few things, and uh, those are. Those are those are not much. It's not enough to cover whatever we, we need to consume. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix of, but I think right, even right now, uh, even though I have a farm, still being bought from, from a shop nearby. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think uh, what I want to know and want the audience to know is also to think about the economic cost of imported food. If you are relying too much on food that is not produced by yourself, then you being an agri entrepreneur ought to be one who would be eating maximum percentage of your food from your own farm. But uh, let's go back to what you mentioned and then ask uh, Peldin and Nisha about their um, views on it. You mentioned how we have come a long way from very um, difficult times, you know, subsistence farming, a lot of poverty around the country. We have come a long way since the beginning of the development process here. So people's living standards are obviously much higher health-wise. Mortality of children, of mothers have also gone down drastically. We have made a lot of improvements. For instance, school enrollment, college uh, uh, passouts, enormous achievements. But then when we think of agriculture, that's where everyone says we have not actually done well. Not only not done well, we might have actually uh, gone worse. Now we have a huge budget every year for the agriculture sector, but if you look at the amount of fallow land, about the number of gungtong, vacant houses, if you look at the import of food from India, uh, just last week, Pinsel or Business Bhutan was reporting 
from 10 billion trade deficit in the past uh, five, six months. So in the agriculture field, we seem to be lagging behind. We are not performing well. You are in the science of agriculture and food science. Right? Sorry, in the college of college that specializes in agriculture and food science. So what is going wrong? When you come out of the college and face real life, are you encouraged to, I'll ask Peldin first, are you encouraged to become a farmer and take up agriculture as a profession? And what do you do, expect to find when you graduate? Uh, I, I guess, yes, there is a problem in our agriculture system right now. We have improved, but then it's not enough. If you go through RNA statistics, if you look like if you scan through the past few decades, mm. uh, the production has been you know when a country, when, when a nation develops, the production the agriculture field must develop as well, which in turn means production would increase. But I I, I don't know why, but then in, in 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 our case, the production has been fluctuating a lot. Rice is a uh, we say rice is a staple food like almost every Bhutanese. Uh, at least once a day we consume rice. Mm. And then when you go to the production of Bhutan annually, it's, it like, it's not even, it, it, even self-sufficient. Mm. We have to import almost double of what we produce. Mm. So I believe, yeah, I believe after studying agriculture, instead of just you know, being like, like hoping that we'd get into a, like civil service, mm. I believe we should you know, think a bit outside the box. Mm. Uh, we, we've been, uh, I'm in my third year right now and I study entrepreneurship. Mm. And yeah, so it's entrepreneurship. I, I, I've never, I, I never gave a thought to it, entrepreneurship. Mm. Uh, in the past, I like recently studied farm economics, entrepreneurship. And it's, yeah, it's extremely interesting. Agribusiness, I, I just recently found about agribusiness. So I believe, I think most people, instead of just going as, uh, you know, working for the government as a civil service job, because it's easier, say, I think what youths like us need to, do, need to know is, in the future, I believe unemployment rate would increase extremely because of the lack of jobs. So it's in our hand whether, you know, you want to be your own boss or you, know, you want to search for jobs. So I believe we should, you know, go for agribusiness since we study about agriculture. So good. Well, then that's good news. You're going to take up farming and agriculture. Nisha, what will you do when you graduate? And what should change in the society and with the state policies for you to become an agribusiness person if you want to? I, like and every individual, uh, most of us here, I would opt for a civil servant, a ser civil service law. Mm. Partly, first of all, I would like to ask, why, why is civil ser service so much, you know, of a thing, you know? Why is everybody so much attracted to it? Mm. There's a thing, the pay is good, the pension is good, there is a quota system, so it's very much attractive, you know? So I would, I would you know, go, go for civil service than to go in other private sectors or the entrepreneurship uh, thing. Because there is so much security in the civil service. So I would I literally go to uh, opt for the civil service. But then uh, we have been complaining a lot, you know, the youths are not taking up entrepreneurship, the private sectors are not paying well. We cannot blame the, you know, private sectors for not paying well. For example, I, I, I'm, quali I'm qualified as a technician and I work as a microbiologist in some, you say, it's the, uh, agro-industry. And my, I have very limited skills and then my contribution to the industry is very less. Then how can you expect the private sector to be, you know, you 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 know, giving me more and paying me more when I don't have, when I don't possess the skills and when I don't contribute their to their profit more? So it's we cannot blame the private sector, and then youth not taking up the entrepreneurship. You know, we I I'm in not in position to you know question the government stretch, you know. 
they are doing a lot of stuff like for example farmer sangye entrepreneurships like uh, entrepreneurs like uh, farmer sangye visit our college you know and then they you know try to motivate us you know i literally get, uh, i literally gain wings you know i want to i was so much you know i was so much exhilarated and so much excited to be you know entrepreneurs when farmer sangye said there's so much you know the free fi uh, the financial freedom and all those things you know but then there's no uh, no uh, no concrete framework or strategy to you know put this plan into action our government is encouraging so much of entrepreneurship but where is the action plan <laughs> i'm not being modest but it is true we should call this spade the spade you know the there is no concrete framework so so i am suggesting i would like our government to give us two options for example uh, let us uh, let us um, we can either choose the rcsc or either go for entrepreneurship so there should be a plan b you know where the entrepreneurship uh, where the entrepreneurs from diverse fields like uh, agriculturists agriculturists and the food tech students and the digital people from digital they have so much skills and they want to do entrepreneurship there should be a platform you know where they where they you know teach us the business, things like business model canvas and the budgeting and there should be a finance uh, the scheme the loan scheme and the funding partners to that platform so nisha for your information there are quite a number of platforms where you can take up entrepreneurship you have um, the department of uh, cottage and small industries promoting entrepreneurship you have the ministry of labor and human resources promoting entrepreneurship you have uh, rook holdings and investments promoting yes. entrepreneurship and then we have csos like lojan foundation promoting entrepreneurship so i think the options are there yes but when somebody is so bright like you in the college of natural resources mm -hmm. want to go for civil service and not do agriculture or food system that's a bit worrying for me mm -hmm. as we know his uh, majesty has pointed out how bloated our civil service is already i think we have some 30 plus uh, now one civil servant for every 30 plus citizens if you talk about public servants we have even more than 50 per citizen um, the whole focus is now to bring down the size of the civil service make them more compact and efficient but yet you know, last year there were more than 5000 who want to sit for preliminary exams this year there are, i think close to 5000 also wanting to again sit preliminary exams then we know out of those 5000 or so about 500 will get recruited by the government. But we still have this cultural mindset, you know, stuck with this secure civil servant position. Again, you got over that. What should we do to change this mindset, especially for the young audience here? Because if people in CNR are not interested in taking up agriculture and food systems, you can't expect other college students to take that up. So what would be your... Um, opinion and your uh, suggestion on how to change this mindset um, in your case you became an agri entrepreneur what made you that it's more of a personal reason that i wanted to do something with food and uh, agriculture uh, I, I i studied technology and when i came back uh, I, I i went thought process and uh, what i realized was technology in itself is basically uh, a, a fancy tool it's just a toy uh, without having any real use to people it doesn't have any soul in it and food was an interesting place that could uh, use a big hand and not just here globally agriculture is the least digitalized sector globally and uh, and also interestingly uh, agriculture is also the sector that contributes 60 percent of the global uh, carbon emission so looking at all of this it it, it was a challenge uh, when I began <laughs> to, to get off into it. And along the way, in that process of uh, pursuing entrepreneurship and trying to m make the business work, uh, um, my father suffered from uh, stomach cancer. By the time he was diagnosed, he, it was already too late. And I, I, I spent four to five months in the hospital bed with him. And during that time, I did extensive uh, 
reading on a on, on lot of things, but uh, uh, the conclusion that I came is like most of the disease is actually, it actually comes from food. Uh, it's not like it's what you put from your mouth. It's going inside and that's going to have real impact on your body. So uh, that was interesting. So all of those added up to a point where uh, even when things really weren't smooth with the whole entrepreneurship journey, uh, uh, that I think that was the motivating fuel that kept me going. Uh, but if I were to recommend someone, if they want to become an entrepreneur, I think it really should be left to the personal choice. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, unforeseen challenges and uh, problem that comes along the way. Um, and uh, if I look back into my own experience of things, it's, uh, I mean, there have been a lot of fulfilling uh, experiences, a lot of learnings, but also I think the challenge is real. Uh, and like average uh, Bhutanese young kids are coming from low income family and we cannot expect them to have, uh, have that, uh, uh, you know, it's a big responsibility to take basically. And you're, what you're risking is the stability of your loved ones, uh, even your own mind. So, uh, I think these are all things that needs to be assessed before we sugarcoat entrepreneurship and throw it to everyone. Uh, I, and, I, and, and I feel entrepreneurship is not necessarily a job. It's more of a mindset. You could be in the civil service and have an entrepreneur mind, mindset that would help us solve a lot of the problems that we, we seem to be discussing. So um, for me, I think uh, if I look back, I've been an idiot. I took a lo uh, lot of things because I was really excited about it. I just saw the optimistic side of things. And when I went along in the journey, uh, there was a lot of uh, mistakes, and mistakes comes at a price tag. And sometimes you're not ready to pay that. So uh, all of these things, uh, you, 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 you become really bad at a lot of things if you really want to uh, uh, make something work to a point that is up to your satisfaction. So um, yeah, from that sense point, I think uh, with the whole entrepreneurship movement being pushed because there's unemployment problem, I don't think that's the right way to go. Some people might get to it with the wrong idea and I think we don't want that. Uh, so from that sense point, I think, uh, yeah, for me, it was because I was an idiot and I want to follow, uh, follow my own <laughs> way of thinking. Uh, but if we are to suggest to someone, then I think we need to really assess, uh, analyze, and look at all the factors and uh, yeah, possibly all the, uh, the externalities that would come out if it does not go as you hope. And it will always be that case, right? Even statistically, one, I mean, nine out of 10 businesses fail, which means you have to start 10 business just to get one through. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, like even for my young friends, do you want to take that uh, risk and experiment uh, while uh, you lose your friends, your your maybe even your girlfriends, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, with all these things in place, I I I, I, I still think it needs to be left to the to the personal choice. Yeah, I don't think you should uh, describe yourself as being stupid in choosing to be an agri entrepreneur. Um, as you said, it's a matter of choice, and some people are more. Um, tuned to become innovators, uh, masters of their own life. It's actually a passion, isn't it? It's a vocation you take up if you I, I totally uh, take agree. up yeah, entrepreneurship. Um, but that's not to say, again, that becoming a civil servant is lacking any innovation or passion. I True. think uh, it's really the difference in your passion. Now, I want to go back to Nisha and uh, Pelden. So, um, Richard, you mentioned about how there isn't a very conducive environment for you to become an independent entrepreneur and you therefore choose a very comfortable civil servant's position if you get. And I think even in a civil servant's position, you can be in a very important position to make a lot of big changes, you know, to design policies and procedures that will impact so many lives um, on the ground. Um, and Pelden, of course, you mentioned about your choice to become an uh, agricultural entrepreneur. When you get out of the college, you will be facing that real life situation where you'll have to make the choice as Ugen pointed out. 
do you think the college education here is preparing you enough? You have the faculty members, the vice chancellor, and the president who are listening. If you have any suggestions on how you can improve either the curriculum or the pedagogy, the uh, food in the dining halls, whatever it is, is there anything you would think would help you come out of the college and become more productive citizens, either as a civil servant or as an agricultural entrepreneur? Nisha, what do you think? I still, I believe that uh, CNR is different from other colleges because we have lots of practical going on. It's not about theories, 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 and all those things. We have lots of practicals going on. But then, then we, uh, I'm not saying that theories are not important. Theories are also important. For, ex for instance, there is a whole pyramid of learning, you know. There is when there's a thing that when you learn the basic concepts of things, and then you start analyzing, and then you start creating your own thing. So I would like to suggest that first, first and second year is very, very important, you know, foundation. It is like the foundation, foundation to, you know, learning, learning something new or getting into civil servant. It is the basic foundation. So I'd like to suggest the college to, you know, focus really, really, uh, really you know, so much on this um, first and second year where you build up all those basics. La. For instance, focus on theory, you're saying. yes, yes. First, firstly, the theory. The theory is important because to analyze something critically, the theory and the basics are important. For instance, I was in, uh, I was, I was, you know, I was after second year. I was, uh, uh, I had the internship in NFTL, that is National Food Testing Laboratory, and there I was asked, you know, I was, you know, hurled up with the questions like, how does this work? For example, when there is a basic test, what's what's happening there? What's where does this bond go? And all those basics, uh, basics, you know, and then they, 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 you know, they kind of expect us to know all those basics, but then all you learn in the college is not enough. It's not focused well, I guess. So I didn't know the basics of, you know, what is reduced sugar. That's the basic of food science, you know. The little things, I didn't know those. So I think those little things, the basic concepts should be focused on uh, focused in first and second year. Like it will, when you reach in fourth and third and fourth, Fourth year, there will be lots of concepts, new concepts coming up, but then the basics will be those. So I, I would like encourage uh, CNR to, you know, really focus on those. And then also the practical. Practicals are in CNR are, you know, they are relatively much, they're doing much more than other colleges. They are, our college is much more practical oriented. But then, but then uh, we lack resources and the technical personal personals to you know uh, really train us. For example, like in NFTL, when I joined there, they they were like bring nine tips for TPC, uh, you know, prepare the LT broth and you know autoclave it, and I was like you know dumb sheep there, <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. So these things should be you know the practicals, practicals, you know. Uh, what we require in the field should be really trained well in CNR, I guess. And then also, when you reach in third and fourth, when you, all those basics and all those, you know, is built up, we should be focusing more on critical and real life issues. For instance, like uh, I'm about to be graduating, and then maybe I'll take up, uh, you know, be a technician and all those things. And then when I am facing the real life situation, for instance, I work in the agro industries and there is some problem related to food. You know, you know, the consistency of the jam is not well. And then they, when they ask us, you know, what to do with this, I should be able to, you know, solve that problem. So from that point of view, view we should be taught. And then we should be doing more of, you know, critical case studies, you know, real life situations and all those things. Quite a lot of suggestions, Nisha. I got attached in Pangil Georg in Wangdi. And yeah, there were some things that I did not learn in the college that I had you know, the opportunity to learn during that time. So yeah, I, I think I, my suggestion for the change in the curriculum would be in the first two years, we, uh, 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 for a context, uh, uh, agriculture is development nested, meaning for the first two years, after first two years, there'd be like 
people going from diploma and people who would be opting for a degree. So I believe what CNR should, I am suggest, uh, my suggestion would be for the first two years, I think the college needs to stress, um, you know, regarding how an extension officer works because after diploma, normally it'd be, uh, the, the people who'd be going out of diploma would be opting for, uh, as an extension officer. And then also, I think what CNR should do is keep entrepreneurship as an elective for the first two years. So if, even if we don't get as an extension officer, we'd at least, you know, be able to open up our own farm, start an agribusiness. Again, it's not compulsory, but then that's why I said elective. And then, yeah, but then at the end, I, I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank CNR for their immense you know, knowledge that they've given me. My first option was not to come, like, was not agriculture. I, I came here because my father wanted me to. Yeah, but then after coming here, after staying, staying here for two years, yeah, it's, it's been really great. The curriculums are, CNR is different. It's different, but in an extremely good way. The lecturers are great. The practicals are, yeah, the practical, it's practical oriented, meaning you'd learn more. When you do, you learn. When you listen, you, you, you kind of forget. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd like to thank Sienna, but then there are things, like I said, regarding extension officer and uh, stressing on entrepreneurship as an elective, mm -hmm. not compulsory though. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Wonderful, well, I think, um, one thing that young people must know is, because I work at university as well, not everything can be taught as part of a curriculum. Right? And what is very important, very, very crucial is the sense of learning by oneself. Foundational things, you ought to know it yourself. There are plenty of resources online today and in the library. So I think it's very good suggestions that you made. And I think the faculty will take it up. Again, in your case, I'm not going to ask about your suggestions for CNR, <laughs> but what would you think would make a life of an entrepreneur, agri entrepreneur particularly, easier? If you have few policies in mind, who knows? We may have some policy makers in the audience. There, there are a few challenges that I think uh, is, is worth sharing. I think, uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I think it's the perception of uh, being uh, taking that job and then how people see you. Uh, I think there's nothing much we can do about it than the how individual feels about himself with what he is doing. In my case, I, I actually feel uh, actually very happy be, uh, calling myself a farmer. And it's, it's quite a, a joyful experience waking up in the morning and sometimes going to the field and doing some things. And with the rest of the day, I carry on with other, other things that I need to do. Uh, but the problem have been uh, when we're trying to uh, run it as a business. I think uh, the whole uh, dynamics of agriculture came all the way uh, from a group of families coming together and then working on the field. And um, you, you do not have to pay your wife or your children. And when we look at the same farm from a perspective of an enterprise or uh, an entrepreneurial uh, business, then uh, it, it it changes. I think there's a lot of new variables that comes into consideration. Uh, you need to keep hire people to keep them on the field. Uh, and then sometimes with the given area of land that we have uh, or, or with the existing business model, those things does not seem to be working. Uh, with, uh, with policies and things like that, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, support, I think, from the government, from a lot of uh, institutions. I would actually like to name a few of them: you know, the National Post Harvest Center, you know, the National CSI Bank, uh, even Loden Foundation and Bhutan Foundation, uh, even institutions like UN. They're all working hard to actually make those things accessible. But I think the fundamental uh, thing that we're not being really able to uh, grasp, or this might really be my personal opinion, um, is that I don't think we have a long-term strategic vision for agriculture. Uh, everyone is working in silo, just like the government. Uh, the farmer of this village does not know another farmer. And if I'm a new guy going into another village, I'm almost like hostile. 
it's really hard for me to understand their social dynamics, uh, their cultural fabric, which would, which is the reason why I think a lot of young kids cannot stay back on the farm, uh, which is um, one of the problems that basically I'm trying to solve with, uh, with Greener Life Farm. Uh, we're basically trying to create, uh, because I think that needs to be the basis. If we can make the farm for uh, young, young kids, uh, I think uh, there is opportunities, uh, uh, no matter. I think, for, uh, I, I think when we look at agriculture, just looking at from a perspective of growing like maybe three ton of uh, cabbage or some potatoes, I think uh, we, we, we miss out on a very important essence. Uh, if, if you look at Netherlands, I think, for example, uh, they, they, they're the highest producer of potatoes. Uh, and second is America. And America has a landmass that is like 100 times bigger than Netherlands. Now, how did they achieve it? And if we really look from their case study, I think uh, they have focused much more towards uh, uh, towards technology, towards knowledge. And I think or if our agriculture sector could also shift towards that, uh, we will be able to create a secondary and tertiary job within the agriculture sector. And that's basically the hope uh, with the whole experiment I'm doing. It's an experiment because I think there's still a lot of variables where we could go wrong and this might not work. But that's the risk I'm willing to take. And uh, with more people coming into the agriculture sector, I think uh, the whole uh, Think would really uh, move up Sonoma. Uh, and I think w when we're just talking about challenges and recommending uh, policies, uh, um, I can only think about the personal experiences I had and sometimes I am the one who's at fault. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes just because uh, I'm an entrepreneur and trying to make something doesn't make me right. And I think that also seems to be uh, a lot of issue that's floating around. We think that the government is not supportive and these institutions are not uh, helping in a way. Of course, I think there's a gap, there's a misunderstanding of things, but I don't think anyone wants uh, things to go bad. Mm. And I think we all need to come to that agreement and maybe if we can collectively and collaboratively, collaboratively think on how we can make things better instead of uh, looking forward which person to blame or which institution to blame, I think then the whole dynamics would be a lot more different. So uh, wonderful, a long-term national strategy for agriculture. That's a good suggestion. Um, I personally don't think the cultural issue that you pointed out about uh, farming and agricultural career being not seen as a um, attractive one, um, that you said that can't be helped. But we can help that. It's uh, a cultural true, mindset. True. Um, what it basically means, I think, uh, there's a way of living, and and that's the thing about our society. I think even in 206 years, it's filled with rich, vibrant culture everywhere. And um, uh, with that, I think like any anything, it has pros and cons. Uh, um, but I think the the uh, I think you might also get to this point. I think it's it's quite agreeable that. Uh, there are some essential values which we could leverage on. Mm. Uh, agriculture, uh, for a long time, has always been a collaborative community activity. Mm. And, uh, th and I think there are opportunities where we can leverage on, 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 on such values mm. and uh, uh, mm. such beliefs that we hold. Yeah, a specific uh, problem we have today is how agricultural and farming career is not given any prestige. It's, it doesn't have that sort of status. And it's a cultural uh, sort of view that we have, right? And I think we have to work on changing that. And perhaps one practical way to change that would be for a place like CNR to recognize agricultural people. Nisha earlier mentioned how farmer Sangye comes here to talk. But I think it would be very appropriate to have local farmers and gardeners, uh, floriculturists to come and talk to the students here. Now, I, somehow we have failed to recognize people who are producing the most fundamental thing in our life, that's food. And on both the state level and individual level, we'll probably have to change that mindset. And once you get that recognition, it will become a prestigious career option. Um, now, we have been talking about food production and how we can be better producers. But the other side of this food system is consumption. 
and uh, in my own lifetime, could say our consumption habits have shot through the roof. Now, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if a man had five goals, he is a very rich man, right? And now five goals, you are a poor, really poor chap. <laughs> Most young men here might have 10, 15 goals. And talk about kiras for girls. I mean, pair of shoes, I don't know how many pairs of shoes each girl here in the college would have, 10, 15. I know friends who have 100 pairs or 200 pairs. So our consumption habits have really shot up. While our production has not sort of come up, it has uh, gone down. So that's the problem I see, that we can't make our ends meet. When you go to your dining hall, well then, are you conscious about how much you're consuming? Do you ever leave extra food on your plate? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't really think about that. Mm -hmm. I was... I, I was brought up in a household where I was taught, finish what you eat, finish what's on your plate. Mm. So I, I've been staying with that mindset for almost all my entire, entire life. And I've like never really thought about it. But I do agree that witness consumption habit is a bit unstable, probably because uh, we don't have much diverse, like, mm. diverse food products mm. uh, to begin with. Like almost everywhere now, there's rice, chili, and like when cardamom was gaining its fame in Dagana, everyone started mm. growing cardamom. Yeah, so I believe we need diversification mm. to f change our consumption habit. Mm. Yeah, but uh, I'm actually leaning in more on how much we waste. Yeah. What we need to consume, I think we all have the right to a very prosperous life. So we should consume what we really need to, what we enjoy consuming. But we waste a lot of things, energy, food, clothes. Nisha, particularly girls, you know? food aside, if you look at, talk about clothes and jewelries and gadgets, girls seem to consume more. Um, what can we do to change this trend of consuming through peer pressure to show off? You know? So what's happening in the heads of the young people that make them consume and get more and more goods? That's quite critical. <clears throat> well, to uh, answer that, uh, firstly, prior to this discussion, I had uh, conducted a survey, a very vague survey, and then what I have got is that girls tend to, uh, in terms of food, girls tend to ha consume and like mo consuming more, you know, fancy foods like like mm. like the burger, say the pizza, more than boys, and then. But I also believe, I generally uh, also believe that girls uh, try to balance their diet more. Mm. And then, you know, uh, eat the right food. For example, my friends, they have been very conscious with their diets uh, recently. <laughs> and they, they are including, you know, detox water and all the stuffs in their, uh, in their food. So it is... Uh, it is true that girls consume more and then uh, and then they spend a lot of money on that but it is also true that girls i guess in particular in in cnr and related to the youth i have no comment about uh, those who are doing you know well in their life but the youths uh, particularly girls tend to spend more on jewelries or the food or everything um, i guess the sustainability is always taught in our uh, country, you know. We are told to, you know, consume, uh, take what, uh, mm -hmm. you know, take what you can and eat what you have, you know. Mm -hmm. As said by Paldon, you know, there is a mindset that, you know, you can, you can put, you know, in the children. For instance, uh, I have a friend, she uh, she's, uh, studied in Tzhafil, and then Tzhafil is in Ha. So, in that school, they are taught clean plate policy. You are not allowed to throw food. You are not allowed to throw food. So that that mindset she has carried to my previous school, that is Drugel, should never ever, uh, you know, waste food. So she has that, you know, belief. So that we, this is the mindset that we are, we need to change. And then, and then the schools like that, uh, schools we can tell our, uh, you know, you, you know we, we can ingrain such value. One of the things that I've been quite pleased to observe is here 
unlike most of the other meetings and gatherings I've attended, there's not one single uh, pet bottle water being served. We're being served water in this beautiful UN mug. And uh, I've been, in, been campaigning to stop bottled water because in countries where you can drink straight from the tap, it's almost 300 times more expensive. At least in, in Bhutan, where we can't drink straight from the tap, you can boil, buy a water boiler, buy a mug, do all the calculations, and it's still 30 times cheaper to drink from the water boiler than from the bottled, um, the, from the bottle. The other factor, especially for CNR, I think is, you know, as Jerry pointed out, you are now being championed for climate change. If you have to think about environmental conservation, you have to think about the carbon footprint that your food and your uh, clothes uh, leave behind. So I think it's very encouraging that you, you, know, you have responded by saying that you don't waste much food and waste is concerned. I hope everybody in the college thinks alike and will, what I call, practice an empty plate policy. At the end of your meal, have your plate totally empty. So don't serve more than what you can eat. My final round of questions before we open to the audience, maybe I'll ask Ugen. We are also celebrating this year the 50 years of UN in Bhutan, the 50th year. As a young entrepreneur, if you're in the shoes of Mr. Gerald Daly, what would you expect the UN to do differently? Say one or two things, not too many. What would really be interesting to uh, try would be uh, maybe uh, from early education, if we can integrate ways where people can, uh, where, where young, young friends can uh, uh, think about entrepreneurship, where, where they're given uh, access to small amount of finances and they could work on projects. Uh, and uh, they could do this independently. We could host like maybe a national competition on, on various things where we allow our young minds to be creative and let them explore what they really like because uh, the, the, the problem is, I think, eventually, as we grow up, we realize that most of the decision we made in our life has been pushed onto us, not because we wanted to or we were genuinely interested in it. And I think that is uh, that, that leads to a lot of problems eventually. Uh, so I think there's already enough data with UN, and I think UN did uh, a commendable job for all these years. Uh, and uh, maybe something like this could be interesting to be integrated with our uh, early education because so I think we, we, if we can really start from the grassroots and we, we uh, put our young people in a position where they are given leverage and freedom to express and, uh, and maybe to be different. Thank you again for that uh, suggestion, and I hope the UN team here will take that up. <laughs> um, now we'll open to the uh, questions from the live audience here and also the virtual audience. If there's anyone here with your hand up, I'll, take, I'll give priority to the live audience. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Srin Gelson, and I'm studying in BSc Agriculture third year. And I'm very excited to be part of this youth dialogue, and I'm uh, very keen audience here and I was wholly, fully concentrated into the program. So directly going to the question, my question is when we say Bhutan is not food secure, we are depending on the imports from our neighboring countries. What could be the main reason? Is it because of the lack of arable land in our country? Is it because of the topography, the landmark structures? Or is it because of the labor shortages? Or what could be the main reason that we are not being able to produce our own food. Hello. Uh, it's a <clears throat> very interesting and obvious question. Uh, when we say we, who is we? I, I don't think there's enough people on the field who is capable enough to uh, come up with new solutions and new problems that could be faced. Uh, that we seem to be facing. And there also be, seems to be a lot of uh, abuse in this whole ecosystem. Uh, if you look on one end, our farmers are paid the least, and if you look on the other end, our consumers are paying the most. So where does this money go in the middle? So uh, for obvious reason, it's a sinking ship, that this whole structure, this whole modality of 
or, or, or farmers having to suffer the most say that, that maybe we can think this out loud together like, collectively. And, uh, and, and it's true, like, I think, first of all, we need to identify where the problem is, then we'll be able to find a solution for it. But it seems that the problem is multidimensional. Uh, uh, my experience in my fee, on my own field, trying to do things, I, I, I went the simple route of just getting a plot and then trying to grow something in it, then making money off of it, and then investing that money back. And then I realized, after doing a basic Excel, if I try to uh, follow that progression of growing something on one acres of plot, and then trying to make a return off of it. And unless I do something really smart with monoculture, it might maybe take me 100 years to reach financial stability. And who, uh, who would want to head that part? And even if we ask our uh, local farmers, the average income they make, uh, most of them, they make like 10,000 to 15, to 20,000 to 30,000 being the max in a year. So uh, I think all of this number seems to be suggesting that uh, the problem is much more beyond than just one specific problem. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, basically the problem is coming from a lot of direction and I think the, the solution should also be in that manner. I think we are dealing with a very complex issue here. So there's no sort of uh, silver bullet or a sacred pill to overcome this. From the production point of view, you know, we have already talked about the cultural uh, challenge of farmers not being recognized, not being compensated well enough. We have a terrain that's not uh, friendly for mechanization. We have a terrain that's not friendly for supply chain transportation. So a lot of challenges there. And then our consumption has gone up on the other hand. So that's what makes us uh, food insecure. But don't lose heart. These are not impossible, insuperable challenges. <laughs> These are mostly challenges that can be overcome with some degree of um, um, human and mechanical intervention. Next question, Siring, if you can um, share a question from the online virtual audience. Nisha mentioned that she did a small survey which showed the girls tend to have more diverse food than boys. Does the food include healthy food or does that include all types, like she mentioned, burgers and pizza? Also, who did she include in the survey? So it was very simple and a weak survey. So I surveyed the, uh, some of the, uh, you know, I distributed a survey, Google survey form in, the, uh, in CNR, and many of, those, and many of them answered them. And there was a gender where you can say that you are either a boy or a girl. You don't reveal the identity. So I surveyed, uh, you know, I shared this uh, survey form in my, with my friends and then they randomly uh, answered to my questions. And then when I mentioned that girls' food are more diverse, I'm not saying that you know boys are eating very unhealthy and all those stuff. Generally speaking, in the youth, uh, for instance, in CNR, when you are trying to uh, you know eat something, girls tend to make more effort. What I mean is that girl are re girls are more, you know, Girls are more disciplined and they are willing to cook, you know. Boys, they have, for example, myself, I have a set uh, routine, you know. We cook in turn wise. Boys do not have that. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not defaming you guys, but it, it's generally like that. Generally, in youth, like in colleges, girls are willing to cook. And then they are willing to, you know, uh, make changes in their diets. For example, as I mentioned, my friends are willing to, you know, make detox water out of it and then include some, you know, for instance, myself. Um, for instance, myself, I've been lately, you know, very much prone to diseases. Uh, my immune system is very much, uh, you know, compromised. Compromise, and I'm very much, you know, prone to allergies and then infections. So I am trying to make changes in my diet, for example. I'm trying to include garlic intentionally, adding garlic in my, uh, the curry I cook. And then I try to, you know, cook the curry less. You know, for instance, if I'm cooking bean, I'm trying to, you know, cook, uh, process, the, process the, you know, bean less so that the vitamins in it and the nutrients in it is, you know, does not deteriorate, does not mean that girls are, you know, eating healthy. But then, generally speaking, from what I see is that girls are making effort. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you. Very encouraging to hear that girls are into cooking. And boys should take that up as well. If you want to eat well, you need to learn how to cook.
I have got a few questions that I want to ask, uh, make them respond to, uh, and I've already shared that question with them. So very brief responses related to the pandemic. The government recently decided to amend the Tobacco Act. And that amendment has actually not been implemented even now, although it was an emergency bill. Well then, do you think the government should have done that or shouldn't have done that? I believe the government did it for the people. Please. So they should have done it? You? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Nisha? Well, being the situation, I guess the pandemic is, you know, more dangerous than the tobacco. So I think I go with the government. They mm. should have done that. Uh, I think definitely, yes. Wow. Wonderful panels. Very conformative. <laughs> um, but I think it, it, this kind of amendment does deserve some thinking, right? Some critical thinking. Uh, of course, a government ought to have the intention to help the people. But it's not the intention that we are uh, questioning here. It's the process, the procedure. What would be the consequences of this amendment of Tobacco Act be in 10 years time from now, 20 years time from now? We may lose more people to tobacco than to the COVID uh, um, pandemic. Anyway, the other question I have is, alcohol is considered as a number one killer in the country for many years now. Do you think the taxation on alcohol right now is sufficient? Ugen, well, I'll start with you. I think just the taxation won't really help to solve the alcohol issue. I think it goes much more than that. The problem has a much more depth to it. Mm. Nisha? Well, the taxation has, statistically, it has helped curb uh, alcohol consumption mm. about uh, uh, pretty much uh, of the alcohol consumption. But then it's in our hands, you know. Mm. If I want, for example, uh, not the alcohol, but the tobacco, you know. The cigarette price raised from about uh, 150 to 500. But then the consumers were still consuming and sometimes replacing it with beer, <laughs> the cheaper means, you know. Mm. So the alcohol taxation might have a little impact on mm. the uh, alcohol consumption habits, but I don't think it can totally help, you know, mm. with the consumption habits. Mm. Uh, from my observation and my personal experience, I think no amount of tax can stop any goodness to, you know, stop drinking alcohol at all. But then it's all, like what I've observed so far. I, I don't know though. Yeah, no, I'm not making a suggestion here that taxation alone will solve our alcohol problem. In fact, I don't even uh, support the idea that Bhutan shouldn't have alcohol at all. It's part and parcel of our sort of culture, of our livelihood. Um, but when we deal with a problem such as alcohol that's so widespread, with it being the number one killer for now over almost a decade, I think, we ought to adopt all kinds of means. One would be, of course, education and uh, counseling and uh, social support systems, but the other would be a sort of a top-down taxation framework. Right now, alcohol is quite cheap. And as Nisha said, if it's made more expensive, people will control. I don't think people will give up drinking alcohol, but we ought to drink responsibly. Right? Anyway, um, now, the final question, which is going to get a little more philosophical. Well then, do you eat to leave or live to eat? I guess I live to eat then. <laughs> you love to eat, so you <laughs> live to eat. <laughs> okay, Nisha? Uh, when we say live to eat and eat to live, uh, it's more about when you live to it, it's more about, you know, the emotional and the social and the mm. culture side of it. You know, when you say food, it's not just to fill your stomach. Mm. There are so many aspects like culture, social mm. and, you know, emotional. When I, um, it's a means to connect with people emo and then, you know, get emotional, you know, uh, the happiness and all those things. And then also to eat Eat to live is more of, you know, there is a context in Bhutanese, uh, the Buddhist context is like, you know, uh, you should only eat enough to, you know, feel your body to do Dharma. So 
I am pretty much, I would like to go with Paul, then I live to eat. So I'm emotionally, socially, and culturally connected to food. Okay. I would say neither. Uh, I think uh, it, it, both of them uh, seems to like, take us on two extreme end of things. Uh, I think somewhere in the middle, uh, intuitive eating is something that I came across while looking for answer to <laughs> whether we should eat to live or live to eat. Mm. And I think uh, what intuitive eating basically suggests is having a healthy relationship with the food mm. and our lifestyle need. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that makes much more sense than mm -hmm. going to an extreme where saying uh, we're just living to eat or we're eating to live. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a mix of both. And I think coming in the middle seems to be interesting. And um, if maybe I can suggest this, uh, Annie, uh, if, if we could go over an article on intuitive eating, I think it would be, there, there's a lot of interesting prospects. Very, very beautiful for uh, the closing. Intuitive eating, I think in the college where you, think about, you talk about food systems, this will be very, very useful. In the Buddhist context, you would say mindful eating. <laughs> so I belong to the school where I eat to live, not live to eat. I think eating has its uh, sort of fun part, it's enjoyable, but I don't see the purpose of my life to just eat or drink. I think the purpose of my life is much higher. I eat so I can sustain myself with a healthy body, and then achieve a higher, greater goal. And of course, many of you here may disagree with me. I know some people drink as if they're living to drink. Please don't do that. <laughs> there are many more beautiful things to do in life. Um, now, as we wrap up, I normally wrap up with a Buddhist or a Bhutanese proverb. Today, I was uh, struggling to find one, and I settled for a very common, simple one. Zamaza donluta bemave shuluta, which all of you know. Judge by the face whether you have eaten well or not. Judge by the outcome whether you have done well or not. And I hope you will have a good face as well as a good outcome at the end of the session and also at the end of your college life here. So thank you, everyone. Thank you also the live audience, wherever you are. That's all. Thank you.